Welcome to Evolution Hour. Quickity clack. Analog media. Ancient times. And TortuganWordPress.com, where we maintain piles of material freebie to be shared far and wide on subjects relating to evolution and creationism. So let us also get our um, dear patrons who have helped us every day and week and month through thick and thin, up and down, and in and out. Our uh, colleagues, researchers, assistant researcher, friend levels, and all of the legacy patrons that have helped along the way. Uh, can't do without you folks. So um, today we have sort of a triple feature uh, instead of just a dual feature. Uh, we will be getting, of course, to uh, the latest wrinkles, finishing up the uh, systematic material on the Creationist Titans book. And there will be a part two in relation to the music depreciation class, uh, a posting from um, a new kid on the up doc, uh, oh, Andrew Snowden chatting with Michael Dooley, some kind of new people in the creationism apologetic frame where they're stepping into the kind of culture camp notions about what's legitimate music and the like. And it's astonishingly vague. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but also uh, a report that... Um, I did over um, the week, well, actually Friday, I attended uh, Christian Sidor's uh, lecture at EWU, Eastern Washington University, out in Cheney, um, on um, uh, Australia, uh, no, Antarctic and adjoining region uh, paleo uh, geography in, and critters in the Triassic before the dinosaurs came along. And I had quite a lot of material on Sidor. He's uh, done lots of stuff on the evolution of mammals. I've cited him in both of the books uh, in there. But uh, this was all new material that's been it, uh, uh, working on this for the last few years. So I've had a field day. Uh, taking notes, as you can see, uh, these were the uh, technical papers that are in my reference bibliography, about 20 or so, uh, that... Um, I had of Sidor's uh, earlier work, most of which we've cited in one of the other books. But anyway, um, it was a really delightful uh, talk, um, connecting up the relatively sparse paleontology that's available uh, in the area. You've only got little snippets of rock that are exposed above the ice. So obviously you don't know what's going on underneath the miles of ice that they can't get to. Um, the rocks that they're dealing with are all from the Triassic period and they have a range of material. They have a little bit of stuff in the Permian and then into through the Triassic, and then there's other areas that relate to um, uh, further things. And the dinosaur paleontologists, of course, have been having a field day uh, finding the dinosaur stuff. That's not what uh, Sidor is dealing with. He's dealing in the earlier period um, in the Triassic, which is at the time just up to the uh, uh, proliferation of dinosaurs. And eventually they're going to be uh, coming into Antarctica by way of uh, South America and Africa are all joined together in the big uh, supercontinent in that period. And then if you imagine Australia kind of tucked on its side and stuck on the edge of uh, Antarctica, uh, anything that wants to migrate through to Australia has kind of got to go through Antarctica to get there. So there's a biogeographical implication of all of that stuff. Um, the newer material, alas, is not available open access, uh, but there's quite a few of the papers uh, that um, he'd done on uh, the um, Fremal Formation, which is one of the main uh, um, Triassic one in this uh, ridge that comes along in Antarctica. Uh, there's a, a couple of papers in 2014 uh, that I'll be putting up, and also uh, the one recent one, uh, GI 2022, on um, um, some of the other paleontology that's available there. And they essentially the fossils that they're getting, hi Brian, uh, the fossils that they're getting are very fragmentary in nature. Once in a while, they've got a fairly complete one, but an awful lot of bits and pieces of stuff. So that has to be borne in mind in, in the superstructure, but they're still able to catalog um, a fair amount. Of, and in the newer material that's not yet open access, uh, they did just did a, a big review uh, on the topic, uh, I think the Journal of Paleontology, that, um, uh, yeah, let's see, it was in the um, Earth Science Reviews. 
um, that basically summarize material that they've done uh, recently. And um, it's an interesting mix because when you're coming out of the Permian, there was a, Antarctica itself had been in a glacial period during the Permian, and then it switches to a coal uh, forming. Uh, phase in um, and uh, somewhat uh, warmer, but you're still in the polar area. Uh, and then you get uh, and virtually no sign of any uh, vertebrates in that area. That doesn't mean there may not have been uh, because of the uh, limitations of the fossil record in picking up some of these little fragmentary bits, but they're certainly not abundant enough, they're just on the luck of the draw showing up. Now that changes as you move farther in the Triassic and there's a climate shift, which is still a puzzle because it's got lots of growth and, and a, a little more sparse, not as densely forested in the coal forest mode uh, in the um, farther on in the, the Triassic, uh, but also not terribly hot. And so this is where the real puzzle comes in because there apparently are an awful lot of amphibians uh, down there. We've got uh, the uh, Lystrosaurus, which is the synapsid bunch, the pigs that took over the planet. They, they proliferated all over the place. And if you look at the Karoo deposit, which is just west of Australia in uh, South Africa at the time that the supercontinent was formed, um, you can't throw a dead cat five feet without bumping into fossils from a Lystrosaurus. They're all over the place. Uh, but Although there are uh, quite a lot in this Australia, uh, the Antarctic um, example, they're not nearly as common as you're finding over in the South African context, which is suggesting that there's some paleo uh, climate issues that are of interest. Another factor um, that I noticed was the absence of pterosaurs, at least so far uh, in that range. Uh, and also that it that the although there are uh, the synapsid bunch, they're not necessarily reflective of the ones that are easing into full uh, endothermic warm bloodedness, as is the case with the uh, uh, therapsids and the like uh, outside of that. So they're not apparently giving them a leg up. Whatever advantages endothermy is coming in on the mammalian front, it's not showing an obvious indication of helping uh, critters uh, down in um, uh, Antarctica. Uh, but these temnospondyls, uh, amphibians, uh, some of which were very large, and they've even found juvenile examples of some of these larger ones as well. So there's been some really interesting little fossil troves that have come out of it. Um, it's an interesting issue about the fact that amphibians are not typically associated with relatively cool climates. So whether or not we're dealing with something about the uh, metabolism of these groups that is missing in current amphibians is another factor that's popping in down the scene. So it was it was an extremely interesting uh, lecture, went on for about an hour or so, uh, and there was an awful lot of good uh, uh, questions. Moi asked a few questions uh, as well, as I tend to do in these things. And uh, so it was it was a very um, uh, useful enterprise. And I, I'm, I'm sad um, if there are cases of uh, university level areas where they're not doing what we've been doing at Eastern Washington University for years. Uh, which is to have uh, um, a, an important scientist uh, who uh, comes in and uh, gives a really good technical level uh, discussion in front of an audience of uh, undergrads who are just in the opening stages of their uh, uh, worldview. They've uh, they built a big new science extension uh, out at EWU, and so they've got very, very nice facilities. I was strolling around through part of that. Um, uh, when um, uh, after the show was over. Anyway, uh, that will be that part. Now we can get to our little bit from um, uh, our uh, Sarfatian tape. They're, um, they're riffing off of a couple more technical papers, which I'll be putting the links up to uh, because at least they are available. And one of which is, uh, well, a couple of them, they're actually from the 2020s. Uh, but Although they're riffing off of the papers, they also are citing general commentary stuff. And it's looking like, given how relatively superficial they are citing the papers, that they're probably just riffing off of those secondary accounts and throwing in the technical citation as kind of meringue. Um, the um, one is about uh, Titanosaur, which is a big sauropod uh, that... Um, they've found a juvenile of that apparently has the eyes more towards the front 
uh, which gives a binocular vision as opposed to the on the side mode that you find in the adults. And also that it has kind of, it's described as a nose horn, uh, but it's a really teeny little thing, which is, uh, which the paper itself uh, compared to the tooth projection that birds have uh, on their uh, shell breaking tooth, uh, which isn't really a tooth at all. And that this may have possibly perform a similar kind of a function in it. So it's an interesting little developmental biology bit. And the creationists are just kind of lobbing this information out as though it's supposedly indicating that maybe there were fewer dinosaur taxa to stick on the ark because of identification of what something is a juvenile or not. Uh, they're, they're not exactly fantastically uh, uh, detailed on this. The other one, uh, the, the other uh, first was the Kundrat paper uh, from 2020. And uh, the other is from Del Corso 2020 on the Carnian pluvial episode, which uh, is not a term that I had known a great deal about until just about the last year or so. Uh, there have been some videos on the subject and um, uh, I uh, filled in a bit more material on this because it was so interesting. During the Triassic, there was a um, period of a couple million years where it rained a lot. And um, the uh, uh, Del Corso paper is suggesting that this peculiar environmental condition helped contribute to weeding out and producing something of a mass extinction small scale one that was ultimately contributing to the greasing of the skids for the rise of the dinosaurs afterwards. And um, the paper has an awful lot of technical information and interesting things about taxa and biogeographical distribution and all that kind of stuff, which is not really covered much in the SciTech Daily account, uh, the generic one, which uh, Sarfati and Tay also linked to, as well as they did with the uh, a commentary on, from New Scientist on the Titanosaur. And so I kind of wanted you to be able to see the uh, secondary accounts and the regular papers themselves to try to imagine what's going on in the creationist mindset where they're just scavenging for little bliplets, getting them from generic sources that are not inaccurate per se, but they're not the detail paper, and yet going out of their way to cite the actual paper that has so much information that they're not dealing with in their creationist model, particularly in terms of paleogeography and all the rest. Um, I think all of that is along with the fact that uh, the big chunk of what's filling out the rest of this chapter are more creationist posts. So we're looking overall that only a uh, little under half of their source material is science-based. And most of that is from secondary sources, not primary sources. And the primary sources that they've been dealing with so far, they're missing information from about half of them. And then they've got their big block that's coming up onto 60%. Uh, that's just repeating the tropes, of almost all of which are from uh, Creation Ministries International. So it's an extremely in-house thing. I, I haven't seen many creationist books that are this um, echo chamber heavy uh, in quite a long time. Uh, the, the old school of the Dwayne Gish type was to just inundate you with the regular scientific literature, carefully cherry-picked, of course, uh, but this is not what's going on in here. This is an apologetic screed from uh, CMI that is just dibble-dabbling along the way with technical material and mangling it all through the, the line. Um, I find it an intriguing thing to get to. And judging from what I've glanced ahead regarding the individual taxa, uh, they're not going into any detail at all on any of these. They're just dribbling up like the kind of little poster card that you might get in it for kids that would give just the taxa name and some rough statistics about how big it was and all of that. And that's as far as it goes. Uh, so it, it's going to be interesting to see what technical literature they're dealing with. I suspect they won't be diving into an awful lot more until they get to the multiple chapters that they have on bird evolution, where they really don't like the, the bird evolution thing. And so it will be spinning all of the same tropes that we alluded to in the earlier books in, in various modes. Now, 
the other uh, bit that I uh, did bring up then was this uh, Andrew Snowden 2023 interview uh, with this Australian uh, musician, uh, Michael Dooley, who is a convert to young earth creationism. And it's very vague as to what exactly creationists he had in mind in here. Uh, but along the way, uh, he put up some interesting little comments about the nature of music and how he was objecting to uh, the, the decline of the great Christian composers of the past in comparison to the more modern ones who were dealing with dissonance and all of that. And um, well, you may have noticed behind me are all these CDs and there's um, considerably more in the realm of my um, uh, LP collection, and there's even some more CDs and a little thing underneath uh, that that uh, the books are sitting on top of, um, hundreds and hundreds of them. And so I'm not casually familiar with the classical music realm, and I'm also not completely unfamiliar with uh, often the religious views or non-religious views of the people involved. And so it would have been really fun if Snowden had been even slightly detailed in explicating what he thinks they um, duly is meaning uh, by the composers. Are we dealing with um, uh, Brahms? Are we dealing with um, uh, Bruckner? Are we dealing with Mezian? Are we dealing with Stravinsky, Poulenc? Who's these offenders on the modernist front that they don't like? Uh, because they'd be in a mess to try to deal with this, uh, to make a, a division on religious grounds. Um, it, you've, Bach, of course, is an archetypally religious person. Every note of music he was writing um, is based on um, uh, his religious faith, even stuff that is seemingly completely secular. So you can't understand Bach's mindset without thinking about that. But when we move down into the um, uh, classical and the romantic era, things become much more complex. It's not that there were a pile up of non-believers, but um, they're also not necessarily as overtly religious as some might like. Uh, you did find somebody that kind of took the vows after his uh, Hellraiser days uh, list uh, with his daughter marrying into Wagner's family. And she was ultimately, uh, Cosimo Wagner uh, was eventually cozying up to the Nazis because she outlived her husband. Uh, this is not exactly a hot point on that. Uh, somebody else that's deeply religious during that period is Anton Bruckner, a uh, very Bachian kind of mindset, similar religion. I think he was, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure, he may have been Catholic. Um, uh, and um, um, the giant dissonant uh, Wagnerian symphonies that he wrote that annoyed the Brahms lovers during the 19th century uh, doesn't take away from the fact that he was a very deeply religious person. And even then, uh, moving into the modernists, uh, Planned Parenthood is not on my Yes, that's one of the, the entire advantage of being out. Everybody that can watch the show at their convenience. Um, in some cases, I'm in a, a bind when I have a pile up of videos that I need to deal with on a variety of subjects uh, that um, uh, I have to gauge how long the thing is and whether or not I can devote the attention to it if I need to be stopping. So um, I relatively rarely am watching videos live. I'm catching, even though it'd be fun because so many of them have uh, live chats the way we're doing here. And uh, I'd like to be involved in a lot of those. But um, often it's the case, no, I got to catch them after the fact. And that's the case with uh, Dan Stern Cardinale and Erica and Dapper Dino and, and uh, Jackson, my co-author and all that. Most of the time I'm catching them after the fact. Anyway, back to the musique. Um, you've got somebody like Stravinsky, who I don't think anybody is going to think is a musical conservative or that he doesn't use an awful lot of dissonance. Indeed, the Rite of Spring caused a veritable riot uh, when it was premiered in, in 1913 uh, in Paris. Uh, but he was a very religious man. Poulenc, uh, Francis uh, Poulenc, uh, who also wrote very dissonant and astringent music uh, and was gay besides, um, devout Catholic. Um, and uh, then you've got the absolute barn burner for a religious modernist composer, uh, Olivier Messiaen. Uh, also French, um, his Turing Galila symphony uh, is just a, a corker. It's not for the squeamish. <laughs> very intense stuff, very quirky, uh, but also deeply, deeply religious. So uh, the idea that um, um, you're going to find that the religiosity 
is leading to a dislike of the dissonance in modern music is, uh, I guess, our creationist wants music to be very fuddy-duddy as if it were still 1870. But since he didn't go into any details on the subject, uh, it's kind of hard to fit in uh, to the framework. You do have some non-believers uh, in the religious, uh, in the music realm. Uh, Brahms uh, apparently was not uh, a religious person. Hard to tell on a lot of the composers because they didn't bring it up much. Uh, hard to say on Pula or uh, Prokofiev and Shostakovich. Uh, and um, Ives, I think, probably had a kind of liberal sensibility religiosity. Um, how much of a direct churchgoer he was, uh, I don't know. He helped found the uh, estate planning uh, in the insurance biz, but he also wrote music of such ear-wrenching, over-the-top dissonance um, that I suppose... Um, the creationists would really want to nudge Ives over into the atheist camp because they would be horrified to think that they're actually on the religious front. Um, Schoenberg, of course, uh, was um, uh, Jewish. I'm not sure how excessively devout he was, although he did do uh, some religious uh, style music, in particular after the uh, uh, the time of the Holocaust, uh, that was sort of reflecting the social uh, uh, disturbance of that period. Uh, some of the others, I suspect, uh, were much less. Uh, Alban Berg and Webern and others may not have been terribly religious, but anyway. So it's sounding like um, our conservative creationist has problems with music that is not conservative enough for their unspecified fuddy-duddy tastes. And the fact that he was very vague about the roots of what he was, he said that he had read some... Um, Oh, uh, he read some uh, creation books uh, and um, he talks about the high quality apologetics we have now in creationist ministries. Clearly, this musician has not fact checked any of this stuff, but we don't even know what books he had read to kind of get a gauge about where he was coming from. Was he reading uh, old Dwayne Gish stuff, Henry Morse? Uh, was he trying to read more recent creationist books and the like? Ken Ham answers books or something. We, it's hard to say. So it'd be kind of funky one of these days, but the very fact that he's uh, being touted at Answers in Genesis means by definition he, he's a full-out creationist. Uh, anyway, uh, that kind of gets us up to speed on um, uh, that angle of things. It's been um, um, a fun, busy week uh, in uh, structuring through some of these things as I've been getting piling up my material and getting things sorted out for uh, the new book. Um, we're going to be having... Um, an awful lot of interesting, whoops, I, don't know how to, I do not want an app to start popping up suddenly. hate it when these um, uh, things start sticking in a thing that interferes uh, with the operation. Uh, but there's going to be some nice little coordinated charts uh, on um, uh, the um, uh, cosmological end about the, the breakdown of the various components and epochs of the Big Bang, which to me have some really intriguing implications about fuzzy, stochastic nature of what was going on during the first second of the universe uh, because of the fact that things are, if you think of the Planck constant, the, uh, the jiffy, as some wag uh, once called it, 10 to the minus 43rd seconds, the smallest amount of uh, time. I think it's about the time that it takes light to cross the hydrogen atom nucleus, something, something like that. And it's so basically it's the smallest amount of stuff that you can deal with in physics. Uh, Planck time, um, you can think of it as ticks of the clock as to how much, how many Planck units are involved in each one of these little phases in that like first second. And you get a very curious disparity about things. The inflation part is taking place over kind of a long time compared to some of the other sections. Um, and it's producing a gigantic impact in terms of how the universe is running. So all of these things are, I suspect, 22nd and 23rd century physics after they've worked out more about what dark matter and dark energy and the like are, and maybe even uh, popped up some new concepts about uh, particles that we can't even imagine now, uh, we'll probably have a greater understanding of why that pulse of activity was taking place early in the universe. Still probably won't resolve things about before the universe. Was there anything before the universe? If so, what? Because all the physics goes tilt. 
uh, as you start getting into that initial plank time there. You, you just can't make any judgments on stuff. So the universe may have, um, it's the smallest measurable, yes, uh, element. Um, the level of detail, though, as to what's going on in all of that stuff, and there's still d debates about, um, there's still some segments that might disagree about whether or not inflation was occurring or whether or not it's, it speeds up or slow down and the variability of it. When yeah, And they're trying to test all of this stuff out with things like the James Webb telescope uh, to be able to look back into other spectra that allows us, because of all that redshift, in order to look farther and farther back to the earliest stages of the universe, you got to look beyond the visible spectrum. So it becomes uh, trickier and trickier to deal with as you're going into the fog uh, um, in that period uh, during very the very early stages when uh, stars are forming, uh, the first uh, um, uh, generation forms and the early galaxies and black holes and all these other stuff. And, and it's constantly throwing up surprises about the sequence and intensity of things that are again indicating interesting puzzles of what's going on in the early universe, which what you'll find in the creationist literature is they're kind of hovering around the edges some of whom have some physics things, Jason Lyle and a few others, uh, 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 credibility in terms of their skill set. But they're still having to look at all of this stuff and try to cherry pick the pieces out that they can rearrange in order to fit the young earth creationist model. Meanwhile, the regular physicists are dealing with billions of years and just uh, live with it, kids. Uh, so all of that, uh, we're going to be having some interesting little superstructures on that front. Uh, there's going to be um, a, an extensive review of the creationist uh, ups and downs of the uh, second law of thermodynamic trope uh, in the creationist literature, which is not nearly as ubiquitous today as it was 50 years ago. So there's an aspect of how uh, the creationist movement has evolved over time. And then there's... Um, all of the uh, funky little doodles about the advanced physics things and the formation of planets and solar systems and whether or not it'll be a little bit of a sidebar. We'll allude to some stuff about the issues of whether or not there's uh, um, uh, their attitudes about whether there could be life on other planets. But since that's not been resolved at this point, it's kind of a little sidebar. So it's not going to be a big deal about it. And then there will be some funky little doodles happening because some of this uh, cosmology stuff uh, brings us into the wacky world of Kent Hovind, and there's going to be stuff about the uh, uh, the Oklo uh, radio um, uh, plutonium reactor that existed for billions of years in the past as a natural re reactor and how creationists have reacted to that thing. And then you've got um, uh, um, Hovind's stuff. There's going to be a little, little sidebar about his... Um, uh, repetition of, of an issue about a, a World War II aircraft that had crashed in um, the Greenland ice sheet and uh, how he misunderstands how ice uh, stuff are formed and the like. So there's a whole bunch of little sidebars and stuff that, that aren't in some of the earlier chapters that we didn't cover uh, in the first volume that will be treated in as uh, um, delightful little sidebars for this new book. So anyway, um, uh, any questions from our dear guests uh, out there? Um, otherwise, I'll be sticking up my uh, advert for uh, The Rocks Were There, and we can move on, uh, and we can catch you all next week uh, on that. Uh, I don't see any questions, so we'll... Let me bring up my... For it to do its little shtick. Come on. There we go. Okie doke. And then uh, open up my window and share with all of you folks.
Very proud. Oklahoma is always interesting to hear about each time. Yeah. Uh, Erica did a neat little piece on it and, uh, and uh, a few others have uh, hit it on uh, various videos over the years. Um, it's an interesting matter that there, there's a very small amount of creationist literature that does a, tries to do a spin on it because they want to argue uh, or don't want to allow the idea that there can be natural radioactivity taking place over a long period of time that that also they either have to compress it in or kind of deny what the hell is going on but there's not a huge amount of, of creationists that have even bumped into the thing it's, it's a really niche little subject matter anyway um weird weather that's still taking place in a lot of those zones we're kind of a little mild zone here in uh, washington and hopefully that will continue for a while um, yes, the uh, Oklo, the Earth's two billion year old known natural uh, nuclear reactor. Um, that'll all, uh, it, it, there's so many delightful subject matter that pops along uh, that, um, um, and as with the previous book, we want it to be as up to date as possible. So material that's constantly coming in that's pertinent to the various chapters of the book all the way up to the publication date of the book, um, we've been inserting that in the same way we were doing with the uh, first story and the, what I was doing with Evolution Slam Dunk, that I wanted to have it boop, almost almost literally on the day <laughs> that uh, we're sending the files off um, uh, to um, format them for uh, printing. Um, we're adding material in to make sure everything is as current as possible. So anyway, uh, keep an eye out if you are uh, in concerned about wooden penguins on the rampage uh, and then all the other natural problems that we arise and all the unnatural ones like stupid politicians who need to be less scientifically illiterate and make things much smarter. So anyway, uh, stay safe, everybody, and we will see you all next week.